think um, I think we can start. Yeah, let's go ahead and start. You can, you can go ahead and advance. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. have any announcements? No? Okay. <laughs> On my sheet it says announcements um, TBD. So whatever TBD is, those are your announcements for today. Uh, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to see such a full house today. Uh, isn't God good? Thank you for, Lord, for the weather that we're having. Thank you for 
Um, just the amazing uh, display of his majesty. For those of you that, uh, that didn't see the eclipse, I'm surprised. Um, <clears throat> but what an amazing uh, demonstration of God's great power and majesty and control over his creation. So that was an awesome experience as well. Um, we're going to do something new today. And we're going to actually, um, we're going to actually sing the, the, the melody to Amazing Grace again. But we're going to sing it to one of the psalms. Uh, psalms 117. The lyrics will be up here um, in just a bit. Um, but Psalms 117 actually was one of the songs, um, one of the psalms that are a part of the Halal, um, which were Psalms 113 through 118, and that was a part of the, uh, oftentimes a part of the, the, the Passover celebration, the Seder Supper. And um, we know that Jesus, uh, most likely, when, he, when it says that he went, when they went, after they sung a psalm or they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and it was most likely was Psalms 118. But we're going to go ahead and sing Psalms 117 to the tune of Amazing Grace. The scriptures tell us that we should be singing um, to, to ourselves and to others in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And there's nothing, at least from my perspective, that's more profound than actually singing the word of God. So what, a, what an awesome opportunity there is. Um, you can read the psalms. You maybe, maybe some of you that are songwriters or poets or lyricists could, could even come up with a melody that could be combined with a, with a particular psalm. That's been done throughout the ages. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Handel's Messiah, taken, uh, text taken out of um, Isaiah. Um, and many composers over the years have used um, common melodies and putting them to the scriptures, putting them to the word of God. We're going to pick it up a little bit now, and we're going to do a kind of a fun old uh, bluegrass gospel uh, hymn here called Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Oh 
what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Everlasting arms, oh, how bright the path that grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all the What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so dear. Leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all of Everlasting arms. Right. Amen. I love this next song. This is um, another one of those kind of old hymns that expresses, I think, the sentiment of every believer that really ultimately uh, having Jesus is the most important thing. I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain. And be Oh. 
I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead me than to be a king of the vast domain and be held in sins. I'd rather have Jesus than him. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? Hey, let's give it up for the West Side Wranglers. Big hand. Uh, years ago, I heard a quote that has always stuck with me. Is, uh, Every church needs to be willing to do whatever it takes to reach people wherever they are. And so I'll just be honest. Here's what drives me nuts sometimes when people ask me about worship, as if there's only one way to w worship the Lord, and we we think that there's countless ways to worship the Lord. But here's one thing we want, and that is we want to get people that love the Lord and love to be a part of worship to be a part of what we're doing here. Amen? God is good. I want to welcome everybody's here uh, and all of our visitors that are here, all of our online friends. We want to thank everyone that's made this a priority to be here. Uh, we have a huge praise. Last week, uh, after second service, Veda Johnson was baptized, and she was baptized on her 16th birthday. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. I don't know about you, but I can't even remember 16. So I hear it was fun. Today we have an open house, and that is basically afterwards we're going to have some time together, just some desserts, and it's just an opportunity. If you have questions about the church in general, we're going to let you know that's available at 1230. And then I have a huge praise. As I look around, I'm just so excited for all of you. Uh, we survived the massive crowds of the solar eclipse, amen? <laughs> Even those folks that live near Jiffy Tree, you made it. You made it. Uh, we're just so thrilled that uh, we all survived that. So let's pray, and then we'll get going. Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful uh, to be in your house. And Lord, it's amazing. Every Sunday when I come in here, and I think uh, 48 hours ago, uh, this place uh, was playing bingo and drinking beer, and 48 hours later, we are here lifting up praises to Jesus Christ. Lord, you are in the transformation business. So, Lord, I just pray that every word that I share today will bring glory to you, and it's in the Lord's name that I pray, amen. So, we're going to be looking at some different scriptures, but let me explain over the next three weeks uh, what I'm going to be sharing with you. And the key word is connect. And here's what we're going to be doing is I think it is so important periodically to look at the story of God and the story of Jesus and then ultimately what the church's story is. And at the heartbeat of this is connect. One of our missions here, which is an important mission, is we want everyone within the church to find community. Because I don't know if you would agree with this, but we live in a world that is battling loneliness. And we see examples of it all the time. So connection is important. I read this definition, and I think this is so true. 
the, the idea of connection, human connection, is a sense of belonging, having supportive relationships. Connection is two or more people encouraging one another and making sure everyone feels valued, seen, and heard. That's it. And think about the times in your life that you have not felt valued or seen or heard. So the bottom line is we need each other. Now, let me share with you why that's so important. Uh, around the year 2000, there was a book that came out, and the book really was a lot of research. And the research was all about what appeared to be an epidemic. The epidemic was a lack of community throughout the country. The book was called Bowling Alone. And in this deep dive survey, he found that in the United States, there was a, a steep decline in social uh, con connection, community connection. And he gave a lot of examples. For example, a lot of the civic groups, Rotary, Kiwanis, VFW, it goes on and on and on, were de declining. So he said, what is it we're, we're going to need to do as a culture? And then he found these hurdles to be true in the year 2000. Tell me if you think that these are hurdles today for people being lonely. TV. Do you think TV pulls us closer together or separates us? I guess it depends on what you're watching on TV, but it's a tendency. If you think about in the year 2000, what TV meant, remember what 2000 looked like and what TV is now with all the streaming services? Social media. Do you think social media has a impact on our relationships and the list goes on and on we need to realize how important it is to find one another 65 percent of those nationally they uh, they surveyed all these people about connection and uh, this is sad 65 percent of americans said that the lack of civility and mutual respect is worse than it has ever been now think about that that most people say we are not in a good place. Now, I don't know if you've experienced this, uh, and I've been guilty of it. I'm sure some of you sinners have too, but you ever notice when you're parking or you're driving around or you're parking, how many times you nearly hit someone because they're on their phone? Am I the only one that's happened to? And then I realize every so often, oh, I'm the one being honked at. We all have this tendency to look at our phone. I'm not trying to make you feel bad if you're looking at your phone now, but I see you back there. Anyway. <laughs> We all live in this world, and what happens is we fraction, we, we divide, and we need one another. Genesis 2.18 simply says, it is not good for man to be alone. So how in the world are we going to get that straight? Well, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Three significant parts of God's story. And we need to pause in our lives sometimes and just say, what is God's story? What is his story? So his story, first of all, is a beginning. And in the beginning, God's story begins. The text is going to come up here on the screen, Genesis 1, 25 through 27. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds. And all the creatures that move along the ground in accordance to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Verse 26 is so important. And then God said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. Now let me just pause there. Did you catch that? Let us. God's story from the very beginning is interwoven with the story of Christ. So imagine at creation, there's God and there's Jesus. Now, why is it important to talk about God's creation and the wonder of God at the beginning of God's story? Because sometimes in life, we need to realize, all of us, we're not God. God is God. And the greatest evidence of God should start by looking around the world that we live in and go, wow. Wow, look what God has done. Now, all kidding aside, I don't know how you took in the eclipse. Uh, Marie and I uh, did an epic thing. 
uh, we got the glasses and we sat on our patio in our backyard because of the thousands of people at Jiffy Treat. So anyway, we, <laughs> we sat there and I don't know what your experience was. There were a couple of things um, that were pretty amazing. One was, as we're watching in our 3D glasses, is the temperature drop. Like, I mean, I was throwing snowballs. I mean, it was like crazy. And Marie and I both said, wow, man, that was crazy how the temperature dropped. And then the total eclipse, and all of a sudden, all it was just this stillness, and then uh, fireworks started going off. People started screaming in their yard. Now, we live in Nolan County. Amen? I mean, that, maybe things are different over there, but... I, it was like a celebration of God's creation. And it was just such a reminder when it went dark and then there was that, that flash of light. I'm like, God is so good. And if we're not careful, we miss that. That part of God's story is the wonder of God. Psalms 33 verse 8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all of his inhabitants of this world stand in awe. John 1, 1 through 4, listen again to God's story through Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made, and in him was life, and that life was the light of man. From the very beginning, when light entered the world, Jesus entered the world. So when you talk about God's story, start with the beginning of God's story and the power of God's story. And then there's the fall. The fall is what broke God's heart. Now, this is an incredibly important verse that I'm getting ready to read. So if you've got a pen, you might want to highlight it in your Bibles. Uh, I remember when I was in Bible college, and I remember the first time I heard this, uh, the professor said, the first prophecy of Jesus Christ, Genesis 3.15. Listen carefully. And I will put enmity, he's speaking to Satan, between you and woman, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So God lays out the plan right there. He said, there's going to be a war, and here's how this is going to work. Jesus Christ is going to crush your head. How many of you saw the passion of Christ? Raise your hands and see how many. Okay. If you remember when Jesus was in the garden in that movie, and there was this huge snake that crawled, and Jesus took his foot up and slammed it and crushed his head. Now, I thought that was awesome. Jesus Christ has already defeated Satan. But he says, here's the, the bad news, is Satan is going to wound Jesus. He's going to bruise his heel. Now that word, if you look at that verse, enmity, enmity is an important word. It means an intense hostility. It is the state of being an enemy. In other words, he's saying from the garden to the tomb, Till Revelation chapter 21, there is going to be a war. There's going to be a war. And that's part of God's story. Because of what we have done to God, we need a Savior. Lucifer, his name was actually changed to Satan. And that is because of his battle with us. It means adversary. He has fallen angels, and they are known as demons. Isaiah 5 verse 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. John 8, 44 says, Satan is the father of what? Lies. Lies. Rich Pinelli says this in an article entitled Life, Hope, and Truth. Jesus Christ established a beachhead for the kingdom of God. And through his church, though the world remains largely the kingdom of Satan. That's what's sad. We live in a, a world where there is a spiritual battle. And my guess is some of you are in that battle right now. 
Like you're trying to decide, am I going to dance with the devil and play in the world? Or am I actually going to surrender to Jesus Christ? That's a tough decision. But part of God's story is we have to wrestle with that question. And who are we going to surrender our life to? Romans 16, 20 says, And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under his feet. We need to realize that in the fall in the garden, the world fell. And it broke God's heart. I remember years ago, uh, we, when we went down to uh, Disney World, and, and I'm a nerd because I actually uh, purchased books uh, in Disney World. Everybody else buys the fun stuff, but I, I wanted to know more about Disney World. And so I bought this autobiography on Walt Disney. And I kind of, I, I thought this for years and this confirmed it is Walt Disney, from the very beginning when he would develop a movie, always had the same strategy. Uh, the first part of the movie, somewhere in there, he develops a tension. And in the midst of the tension, there's a heartbreak. And after the heartbreak, he starts to build towards hope. So Disney, if you think about it, has a lot of really sad scenes. Now, if you're bored stiff, you can go online. And there are all of these surveys of the saddest scenes in Disney history. Now, you're like, John, you really were bored. Now, so I looked at some of these lists, and by far, here are the two, by far, that people in the survey said, yeah, these are the ones that broke my heart. Uh, the opening from the movie Up. Did you, do you remember that? It's about three minutes, so we're going to go ahead and show that. Go ahead, Jason, would you run it? Yeah. It is so heart-wrenching. They capture this couple's entire life in about three minutes. And they can't have a child, and she passes away. And I'm like, why did we come to this movie? <laughs> and I should have brought this the last time uh, we had our trick or, uh, trunk or treat. Marie and I dressed like the old couple. Yeah, we were awesome. And, uh, <laughs> but you can sense the tension from the moment you started. Anybody remember the tension with Bambi? Anybody? Yeah, drop the mom. I mean, bad news. Okay, number one. The death of Mufasa and Lion King. Isn't that weird? You can remember these. You can feel these things. They even had one on the fox and the hound. And I watched it. I'm like, I'm almost crying watching the fox and the hound. <laughs> when the old lady says goodbye to the fox, I'm like, it's a Disney movie. Well, what do you figure out? There is something about heartbreak. We all know that pain. And sometimes we distance ourselves so far from God, we don't realize we break his heart too. Mankind has broken the heart of God. But the great news is there is redemption. There is redemption. Which is the last point today is that the road to redemption is God's second chance to mankind. I love the fact that God never stops looking for us. Isn't that amazing? My oldest uh, kid, Rachel, um, she just cracked me up when she was little. So she's about three or four years old, and her favorite <laughs> game was hide-and-seek. So here's how it went every time. Okay, Rachel, I'm going to count to 100. That would usually whittle down. I'm going to count to 100, and you go hide. So ready or not, here I come. I'm not kidding. Ten seconds later, here I am. <laughs> I'd walk in there like she'd be behind curtains. I'd pull the curtain back. That's not how we play the game. So you don't let... I, I don't want to sneak up on you. I just decide. We do it again. Ready or not, here I come. Here I am. I'm like, uh, uh, just like your mother. You know, you just, <laughs> Marie, I'm sorry. I think God would love it if we had more of that spirit. Like, Lord, we're all, here I am. And here I am. He wants to let all of us know that we can't run so far that he cannot find us. You know what that's called? Redemption. We are in love with a God who loves us, who wants to spend time with us, who wants to be right with us. I love, I love how Jesus demonstrates the love of God. Luke chapter 24, verses 30 through 33. This is right 
I mean, literally right after the resurrection. It says, when he was at the table with them, there's these two guys, and this is the famous story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. He was at the table with them, and he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he began to give it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road? And I love this. And he opened the scriptures to us, and they got up, and they returned at once to Jerusalem. Now, think of all the ways Jesus could have proclaimed his resurrection. I mean, he, he could have made some TikTok videos. Gone in there, set up hundred the first thing he did he went and he spent time with two and he just shared with them in a way that they figured out that's Jesus that's Jesus remember what he did next he went into Jerusalem and he walked many disciples and once again it was just Jesus and a small group of people that's the kind of love that God has for us through Jesus. And don't you love the phrase, and our hearts were burning. You see, the story is a story of redemption. It is a story and it is a story of second chances. Do you need some second chances? I mean, you're sitting here today, are you thinking, man, I, I hope that's true. Well, it is true. All roads all roads lead to the cross of Christ and to that empty tomb. You one through four. Now, brothers and sisters, remind you of the which to you, which you received, and on which in your stand by this gospel you are saved. And you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you, wouldn't have, you would have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of the first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to scriptures. There it is. Folks, that's all we need to know, that God reaches out to us and he said, there is a death and there is a burial, and there is a resurrection, and that's all you need to know. That's all the hope that you need to know. You see, God, which I love, is in the rescue mission for our souls, all of us. I'm thrilled that right after this service, we're going to announce a little too, but we're going to have another baptism. And what I love about 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 6 is that Every baptism, you know what it is? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every baptism is a slice of Easter. Now, I want you to think about that. Everybody who surrenders. And you may be wrestling with that decision, and you may be thinking, I don't think I'm good enough. Tough, you're good enough. Jesus Christ wants you. And I don't know about you, but I love I love the idea and the priority of rescuing those that are lost. I've shared before that I really enjoy uh, history. And this comes from Winston Churchill. Churchill uh, is an amazing community. 1940. It had been bombed. And this blitzkrieg was just about ready to England and Churchill would just rally the entire nation but I want you to, to listen to his words and there's a little phrase and I, I want you to catch it okay here we go the people of London with one voice we should say to Hitler you have a crime under the sun the least resisted and there has been the most brutal but it was you who began Here's the phrase that I love. Your worst and you 
our best. And perhaps it may be our turn soon. And perhaps it may be our turn now. Don't you love that? Speaking directly, you do your worst because we will do our best. Think about the power of that in our hearts. Joyce Meyer says, your worst day with Jesus is better than your best day without him. And there it is. That's what we live for. That's part of God's story, is that we cannot get so far away from God that he cannot rescue us. Now, over the years, at the West Side, uh, I would say these are our, these are, I would say, DNA or value statements. They're not on a big wall, but I'm telling you, we've communicated it a lot. Come as you are. Have you ever heard that one? A few times, okay. Uh, come as you are. Uh, if we don't serve, we don't survive. I mean, every Sunday morning, I am blown away how this room is transformed. If we don't serve, we don't survive. Prayer isn't something we do before the main event. Prayer is the main event. And this is one that I would like to become our value, that it would weave through all of our life groups and small groups and all of our teams, and that would be this. When you're going through the worst, we strive to be at our best. That's what the church is. Because you never know when you're the one that needs the help. And you come in and you're hurt. And you just need somebody to care. You just need somebody to value you. And in the worst moments of your life, the church needs to be at their best. That is the story of God and that's the story God wants for all of us. So as we take communion, Tobin's going to come up and share, but as we start to focus on communion, you just remember that, that God's story really is your story. Our Heavenly Father, we surrender to you at this time. And we should never get tired of hearing your story as it weaves through creation, through our fault and sin and the fall all the way to the point that we realize we need a savior and you can rescue us so lord we thank you for today we thank you for another moment that we can worship you and it's in jesus name that i pray amen this is such a wonderful part of our worship service to be able to come to the table and Take the elements which remind us of his sacrifice, his, his shed blood and his, bro his broken body. Um, I was intrigued with the story that John was telling about Danielle and the hide and seek and how she would say, here I am. Kind of in a sense what we're doing in terms of our heart preparation now before Al Almighty God, before Jesus, here we are. We need you of um, the, the scriptures, especially in the book of Revelation. This is Revelation, the uh, first chapter, eight. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So what I see in here is a really interesting concept. I think sometimes when we talk about you know, things that have happened in the past, things that are going on now, and things in the future. We always say past, present, and future, right? That's kind of the natural order. But if you look in terms of God's word, the natural order is the present, I am, he is present. The past, he was, he will be. And that really was kind of what I see as the three-part celebration of if you notice um, Jesus, when he was describing his betrayal, there was some pretty significant self-examination going on on the part of the people that were taking, uh, you know, taking that communion, doing that Passover time. They were wondering, is it me? Is it me? There was that self-examination, right? And that's what we're called to do during this time of communion is really examine our hearts. Lord, are there things that I need to make right? Lord, help me to be here in my, in my heart and relationship before you. But we're also told that we do this in remembrance of what he's done for us. That's the past. He's already done that. 
And then Jesus said very specifically that he wasn't going to drink of the fruit of the vine until he came um, and returned and shared it with his bride. That's the future. So we have, we have a past that we can have our faith resting solid on. We have a future that we can hope for and know solidly what's going to happen. But most importantly, he is the I am. He is present. So as we, as we prepare our hearts for communion, remembering what he's done for us, getting our hearts clean and right before Almighty God and thanking him for what he's going to do and the opportunity that we have to be a part of his story. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have um, so graciously um, placed us in your great story. But the emphasis is on you, Lord, what you have done for us. And we're so thankful. We love you so much. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. As we continue our worship now, thinking about his sacrifice, we're going we're gonna to sing a song here. I want everybody to join in and please uh, sing to your heart's content. Um, this is an old hymn called The, the Old Rugged Cross. It's, it's, it's why we're here. It's why we have the opportunity for relationship that we do. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of stuff. 
free from shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown On that old rugged cross So despised by the world As a wondrous attraction for me for the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. In that old rugged stained so As we finish up here, we're going to pick up the temple a little bit and think about your, your commitment, your commissioning, if you will. Every single day, we're commissioned by God to, to share and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our mission statement. Um, and so we're going to sing this last song here, a, a great song. It's called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. 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 No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back.
cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry. To follow Jesus back. No turning back, no turning back. Right, right out there. I think that's the Holy Spirit. That was great. Okay. So anyway, right after I uh, have a prayer here, then we're going to make our way to the back. Anybody wants to uh, stay for your baptism? Okay, Heavenly Father, uh, we are so thankful um, for your spirit. We thank you for the power of that decision to decide to follow Jesus. We just thank you for the worship, and Lord, that everything we do is to draw closer to you. Thank you for loving us so much that you gave us your son. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen.